So, so we'll, we'll come back to, uh, that was just in terms of introducing the modes. Like, like I said, that's really, I should probably should have started with that last time. That's like the first day of a fractional mechanics class. So now what we want to look at is the, uh, a model for, like I said at the beginning, you know, a model for doing predictive analysis of hydraulic fractures, a simple model. And uh, we're going to start with looking at, because in, in a geomechanics application or a hydraulic fracture application, we have a crack essentially that is embedded in a essentially infinite media with far field stresses, right? So we have these far field stresses. And well, in general, you could have, so if this is. X, Y, Z. In general, you could have even shear stresses in the far field. And then we have stresses on the crack face as well. I'll, I'll define those in a second. So, but let's let's call the stresses in the far field. And th so the equations we're going to show will be general. We of course know. Our far field stresses are the, the tectonic stresses, the, the, the SH min, SH max, S, SV. But the equations uh, are more general than that in, that, in the sense that they're uh, for a complete stress tensor, whereas we'd have the simplified case. So I'm going to use the little r for remote, uh, you know, far field stresses. So we have the fully populated stress tensor. It's symmetric there. So those are the remote stresses. And then if we sort of zoom in on the fracture, This, this little notch here is just meant to indicate that the fracture is sort of, in this model, infinite into the, into the plane. Then we're going to have, um, in this coordinate system of the fracture, we'll also have a, a tensor, which are the, f the stresses on the crack faces. So there we're using the superscript C. Now, if the f stresses on the f cracked faces are from a hydraulic fluid, can a hydraulic fluid impose a shear stress on a solid surface? No, right? So it's really just the only ones we care about are the pressure, right, the, the diagonal terms. Um, so, but we're going to define, you know, for now in the general case, we'll define what we call the driving stresses. So these are the things that are going to drive mode one, mode two, or mode three crack extension, as defined early. Right? So since mode one is a pure opening mode, we're going to call the driving stress delta sigma one. So this is the stress that will drive an opening mode fracture. And so in, in these terms, it's the yy component of the remote stress minus the yy component of the stress in the crack. So it's the stress difference between the what's on the crack face and what's remote holding it closed. right? So 
mode 2, is a shear fracture, right? Shear sliding mode. And mode three is a tearing mode. Okay. So these are the crack driving stresses. So now we're going to follow some analysis that's in a paper by a guy named Pollard and others, 1987. I put that there just in case you want to see all the details, because we're not going to show all the details. But they use a so-called tripolar coordinate system. And what that looks like is, So it's centered on the crack of length 2A, where if we're interested in any, any point, let's see. So this is the point A0. Likewise, there's a point over here, minus A0. And then we define this coordinate system. So we basically have three vectors that all point at a common point. And uh, the vector that emanates from the point A0 uh, is characterized by the radius R1 and the angle theta1. Uh, this is the origin. So it's characterized by R and theta. And from minus A, uh, talking about theta2, R2 characterizes it. And then. Um, it just when you work, we're not going to show all the details of the derivation. That would take two class periods. But when you work through all the details, it turns out you get some common terms in the solutions that show up a lot. And so we're going to kind of de define some convenience variables because these terms show up over and over in the solution. I keep wanting to make that stress. It's theta. Okay. All right. So in this coordinate system, they derive the displacement field for any point in the body according to these coordinates. So around a, a crack of 2 length of a 2A at any point, this is the displacement field. Uh, that I'm, you know, I'm about to write it down. Um, so U, the displacement in the x direction, so this is x, the displacement in the x direction is equal to 1 over 2 mu, where mu is the shear modulus. Crack driving stress, the mode two crack driving stress.
Hmm. I'll post them this. I, I, I'll just keep moving forward. Sorry. <laughs> what? No. We'll talk about that. <laughs> no. Uh, yeah, another advantage of this thing over my other one that I is I can easily make the PDF of the notes. So I don't know if you saw, if you looked on the course webpage, I, I actually posted the PDF of last of the actual notes that I derived last time. So I'll do the same. So I guess I should have told you that before you broke your hand. Uh, okay, so on a cracked surface, all right, on the cracked surface, this is the case where sort of all of these all of these angles collapse, right? And so I, I drew them really small, but we're sort of <laughs> looking at in the limit of this go of these angles collapsing, but they can collapse in both they can collapse in this way, you know, so this is this is zero zero. This is A zero. This is minus A zero. Right? So they can collapse in both directions, right? And that would be both be valid on the crack surface. <coughs> so on the crack surface we have R is the absolute value of X. Remember X is this guy. And since it can go either way, R is the absolute value of X. R1 is A minus X. R2 is A plus X. Theta is either 0 or pi. Theta 1 is minus pi or pi. Theta 2 is 0 or 2 pi. <coughs> and then our convenience variables, R is this. Gamma is either pi over 2 or 3 pi over 2. So if you plug those these values in to those equations, and, and now because you get, because some of these have two values, right, you have to plug them into the equations for each pair, for twice, you know, the first set of values and the second set of values. <coughs> and if you do that, then what you'll get is set of equations that looks like this. And the plus or minus now refers to y <coughs> equals 0 <coughs> plus y equals 0 minus. Okay, so this refers to uh, the scenario where actually This is a little bit, I drew this a little, little bit wrong. The idea is that we can collapse to the cracked surface in either, either way, right? So if we're, if we're sort of taking the limit as all those angles approach from this side, approach zero from this side, or 
take the limit as all those angles approach zero from the other side, right? And that gives you the plus or the minus, okay? And so then we can define a jump in displacement at the crack tip for I equals X, Y, Z and M equals one, two, three. So th there's, a, there's a discontinuity at the crack tip and that jump, that jump discontinuity is the plus values minus the minus values, right? And so then what that is, mode one mode two mode three That. So that defines the mode one, mode two, and mode three displacement discontinuities associated with these driving forces, okay? <clears throat> and at least in the mode two case, this is something that's pretty observable, right? If you, I mean, if we go to the field and you have a crack uh, and there was, say, originally some indication of a, of, you know, a natural fracture or a line segment or something like that, and then you were to put it into shear failure and the crack extends such that now that line looks like this, right? Something that was perfectly lined up, whether it was a natural fracture or whatever. Well, now it's not lined up anymore. Well, this right there is the mode two displacement discontinuity, right? And <clears throat> X is your distance from the origin to the tip of the crack, which you see becomes singular. It's like that square root singularity uh, as it gets close to the crack. So uh, this, these displacement discontinuities are accurate in the limit of the, you know, a limit of this approach in the crack tip. So I guess, in other words, what I'm saying is it's going to be zero when you evaluate it at the, it's going to be zero when you're out of, right at the crack tip. There's no discontinuity there. But if you move off the crack just a little bit, then that's your displacement discontinuity, which the mode one displacement discontinuity is an indication of the width of the fracture. Right? So if you know the width of the fracture, then you can solve the f an equation for Lin um, Reynolds lubrication theory equation. This comes from the solution of the Navier-Stokes equations between two parallel fixed plates, right? In the presence of a pressure gradient. <clears throat> so if you know the width, you can solve for the pressure gradient along the fracture wall, right? And if you know the pressure gradient along the fracture wall, these contribute to your driving stresses. I mean, the pressure gradient is, is the stress on the, the pressure is the stress 
on the cracked face, right? Which, and then your far field stress is defined, your cracked driving stress, then you can solve for the displacement discontinuity. So they're coupled, right? So you have to solve essentially these two sets of equations in a coupled way. And then if we go, <coughs> if we go to the solution, uh, let's see, from Jim Rice, 1969, Jim Rice is easily like he's easily the most famous guy in fractional mechanics. Uh, he's still active. He's a professor at Harvard. Um, he, uh, you know, he's quite old now, but uh, e easily the most famous guy in fractional mechanics. So if we if we go to one of his solutions, uh, one of his many contributions to the field, what we can get from the displacement discontinuity is a measure of the stress intensity factor. So the stress intensity factor <coughs> the mode one stress intensity factor is this. The mode two stress intensity factor this. So if we have a measure, uh, th this is actually what I was meaning to say earlier with respect to the, the square root singularity. You see, as so r is the distance from the crack tip. And so as that goes to zero, this thing blows up. <coughs> um, but if you're a small distance away, it's very accurate. Right? So if you know the displa displacement discontinuity a small distance away from the crack tip, we can get an estimate of K1 and K2. And then we can decide if the crack's going to propagate. So if K1 exceeds K1C, which is a mature property we can measure in the lab, the crack will grow. If K2 exceeds K2C, which is a mature property we can measure in the lab, the crack will grow, right? So we can solve the coupled equations for fluid pressure and width for the displacement discontinuity. And then we evaluate the, the stress intensity factor from the displacement discontinuity. And then we can decide if the crack will grow. And so the way this is done in computationally is, you know, our crack is divided up into line segments, you know, discrete. Anything in a computer has to be, you take something continuous and you make it discrete, right? So we take our crack and we break it up into individual pieces. And usually these are, these are, um, the displacements would be evaluated at the midpoints of these line segments. So your displacement discontinuity. So your displacement discontinuity, this distance r would be one half the element size from the actual crack tip. Right. So this this would be r. And it you know this this becomes more accurate as r goes to zero. So as your element size gets smaller, right. So you're going to approach the crack tip, but you'll never get right to it. If I if I take these elements and I divide them by two and then divide by them by two, and I divide by two, and divide them by two. I'm going to approach the crack tip, but I'll never get there. Right? And so, so that what we do, or what they do in these types of software, is then they'll add an element. So if this is true, they'll add an element to the end. Okay? But, in a mixed mode fracture, how do you know where to add it? Does the cracks always grow in a perfectly straight line? Right. So you know you know that you need to add an element, but where do you? I mean, do you add it perfectly straight or at an angle to where it was? So that sort of takes us to our next.
how to add it is based on something called max 